Hello, you're watching a replay of the Facebook Live. And today my guest is uh, Jeff Simmons from the top, the Opportunity Party. And he will answer your housing questions. If this is your first time and you want to learn more about property related issues, then start now by subscribing to this channel. Hi, Jeff, how are you? Kia ora, Max. Good, thanks, mate. Thank you. How do you think your party is performing at the moment? Well, it's, uh, you know, when, when you're starting off, it's always, it's always difficult, of course, uh, particularly when, um, you know, the, uh, the mainstream media channels won't, won't uh, give you any coverage. <laughs> so uh, we, we've been uh, working pretty hard on social media to, to get our messages out. Uh, and, you know, uh, hopefully we will, uh, you know, get some sort of results on election day. No worries. Well, what do you think is your current top housing policy? Keep in mind that most of our viewers are concerned about the housing issues and uh, there is no doubt that this is one of the most biggest problems in New Zealand nowadays. So what, what do you think is your biggest housing policy? Yeah, well, for sure, our, our biggest housing policy is our tax reform uh, proposal. So what we're proposing is to uh, tax housing just the same, uh, to, you know, as all other assets, to make sure that all assets are paying their, their fair share of tax. So uh, at the moment, our situation in New, in New Zealand is that we have some of the lowest um, taxes on housing in the world. Uh, we invest more money into housing than any other country in the world in terms of, uh, you know, that that's really speculative investment rather than productive investment. And we have some of the highest house prices in the world. Uh, so what we want to see <coughs> is that all assets pay their fair share tax as, as if they are, uh, you know, a bank deposit. Uh, and that we use that money that's collected to reduce income taxes. Uh, so by around about a third, we, we estimate we could reduce income taxes by. I see. Um, I recently had a look at the property market in Australia, and they've got all sorts of taxes, land tax, capital gain tax. Uh, they ban foreigners, uh, and they charge stamp duties. Why do you think your policy will make a difference? Yeah, and so, still, uh, by the way, and they still struggle with the high property prices. They, they do. And in Auckland. Absolutely, they do. Uh, and, I mean, there's a few issues here. I mean, capital gains taxes haven't really worked. Um, and, in fact, whenever you look around the world, um, you know, the, the sorts of taxes that have exemptions don't tend to work. Uh, and, th and that's the big problem that we have in New Zealand is that, uh, you know, no political party is prepared to put in place a simple uh, tax that particularly, you know, including the family home, that's the big political taboo. Um, <clears throat> whereas actually, uh, you know, the only way that you're really going to have an impact with these things, uh, any sort of taxation changes, is if they are comprehensive. Uh, Kiwis need to understand that as soon as you introduce exemptions to try and tax someone else rather than, uh, you know, the, the so-called, you know, average household, then inevitably people that can afford um, accountants will find a way around those exemptions uh, and they will, uh, you know, they can afford to, to, to pay for an accountant to arrange their affairs so that they can make use of those loopholes. So, you know, um, we, we really need a, a tax system that is simple and doesn't have uh, exemptions within it. Um, but the only countries that do what we're proposing uh, are places like you know Switzerland, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, to a lesser degree Germany, uh, and most of these countries uh, haven't had any problem with housing affordability. Talking about simplicity, I was trying to get some examples on your website how exactly it will affect the average Kiwi. Are you able to give a quick example? What are you trying to do, say, on a person on an average income and that has one or two properties, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think the the first thing to um, to clarify is that this, uh, you know, a change of this magnitude needs to be in introduced slowly over time, um, because otherwise, you know, we would uh, we would, you know, 
pretty much destroy the housing market overnight. Um, so we, we want to make sure that we don't tip New Zealand into some sort of economic uh, debt crisis. Uh, and so we, we, will, we would slowly introduce this tax uh, and we think it would take about 10 to 15 years to, to fully implement um, <clears throat> so that we can hold um, house prices stable over, over that length of time. Um, in terms of a, a rough rule of thumb about how this would impact when, when fully uh, implemented, um, again, you know, um, <clears throat> we have to see what kind of tax would, um, you know, how much tax would actually uh, be needed to kill off any capital gain um, in, in the housing sector. Um, but our rough rule of thumb is that, you know, a, a, a tax of a, around about between 1 and 1.5% 1 of equity uh, each and every year uh, would, would put housing on a similar playing field to, say, a bank deposit or, or shares in terms of the amount of tax that they would pay. Uh, and that would, for a typical household, cut their income tax by around about a third. So uh, for most people, that would equate to, say, an 8% an pay rise. Um, and that would make, uh, according to our calculations, 80% of people better off. Um, in terms of investment properties, this tax is a, a, a deemed minimum rate of return. So. <clears throat> if your uh, assets are already um, paying a certain declared amount of tax, um, as you know, as a bank deposit and shares are, um, then there's there's no extra tax to pay. So, in terms of investment properties, it really depends what taxable yield those investments are already getting. If they are if they're already getting a minimum yield ab above uh, the, you know the deemed rate of return, then there would be no more tax to pay. If, if they were getting a, uh, a return below that rate, then there would be more tax. So it sounds like there is a lot of unknown in what we're trying to propose. Because like, how am I supposed to decide if I've got, say, $500,000 in equity? How, how much am I going to pay? Well, I mean, like I said, it is going to take uh, some time to... Uh, to fully implement this, uh, and, and what we're talking about is is really a, a, a cultural change in the way that we um, the way that we collect our, uh, you know tax in New Zealand. Um, do we sh should it be borne by uh, the people that uh, earn wages and salaries and uh, and pay rent uh, every week, uh, which at the moment the the tax system uh, particularly burdens them. Uh, whereas, uh, or, or should more of the tax burden be borne by the by the owners of assets? Should we make sure mm -hmm. that the owners of assets are, are are paying their fair share? So I think there's a there's a broader um, you know principle to to discuss uh, on this. But um, yeah, I mean, as a as a rule of thumb, when fully implemented, uh, that's you know how I suggested is is how the how the tax would you know would look from our perspective. But you've also got to bear in mind, under an MMP environment, you know, we're we're um, never going to be, uh, you know, not intending to be a, a you know, a, a major political party in the in the next parliament. You know, we're we're just starting out, so inevitably we would be in coalition or, or working with a larger establishment party, and they would uh, no doubt want to. Um, you know, give things a tweak there. So there, there are always going to be unknowns in an MMP environment. Have you noticed any of the parties um, stolen any of your policies in the last couple of months? Like, did you have any effect on other parties? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think we have changed the conversation around, um, you know, water pricing, polluter pays. Um, we've we've changed the conversation around around uh, drug law reform and uh, and criminal justice for sure, and I think on the issue of taxation and uh, and assets, I mean we have seen uh, the Labour Party uh, certainly adopt a lot of our rhetoric around it. Uh, of course, they are talking about um, exempting the the family home, but they do. Uh, they they are at least uh, seeing the problems that we have, um, you know, uh, from 
a the fairness of the tax system and uh, you know that perspective but also uh, housing affordability uh, and and those those two key drivers are are also the drivers of, of our tax reform okay in hindsight do you think your party should have offered a bit more carrots because like there is just about every party is offering something free and tax breaks and grants and you name it sure i mean um you know uh <clears throat> well with the likes of new zealand first you you know uh i, I would say that you know that, that sort of approach starts to uh, hurt your credibility after a while and that you know they're, they're never really going to be able to deliver on promises of the scale that they're talking about you know I mean, we've worked out New Zealand First's promises of being at about fifty-five billion per year, uh, you know, over the the first term. Um, so, you know, clearly that's not realistic, and I think I think the New Zealand public sees sees that um, sees that it's not realistic. Uh, when it comes to um, you know the the major establishment parties, I mean, yes, they are very much focused on um, on tinkering at the edges. Uh, and, and we're not really interested in, in, in doing that. We, we're looking for a much deeper systemic change. Um, and, and that does require, um, you know, prodding some, some sacred cows. So uh, if the New Zealand public aren't, aren't ready for that sort of difficult conversation, then uh, so be it. All right. Let, let's talk about your rental policy. Yeah. You are suggesting all mm -hmm. landlords have to comply with the warrant of fitness. Do you have any examples, like any any specific requirements that you will implement? Uh, well, the University of Otago has developed a required warrant of fitness, um, not a required one, but but that, that is along the lines of what we would uh, want to be looking at. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a step above what the, um, what the government uh, currently uh, mandates in terms of um, you know up-to-date um, insulation requirements and uh, you know the a requirement to have an energy energy efficient source of heating in the house um, so those you know, th those those sorts of uh, warrant of fitnesses are are out there uh, and could you know easily be be adapted for uh, regulation mm -hmm. and is it going to be if if you are part of the government? How soon do you think um, you will enforce warrant of fitness, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, the government has um, put in place um, requirements that they will start to enforce. Uh, I believe it is twenty nineteen uh, that that they see uh, already the coming into. Yeah, the insulation requirements that are coming into force. Um, what we would like to see is uh, a much greater investment made through the emissions trading scheme uh, in terms of grants. So the, the government's Warm Up New Zealand grant runs out in, um, you know, uh, it, it, uh, I think it's early uh, 2018 now, um, which, you know, really leaves landlords to do uh, their own um, you know, uh, improvements, uh, which will still be needed. I mean, we still have some 600,000 houses in need of uh, insulation and, and upgrading in that respect. Um, but what we would like to do is reinvest the money from the emissions trading scheme into energy efficiency. So that would be um, making sure that homes are warm and dry, uh, providing energy efficient sources of heating. Uh, and we see that being extended to small businesses as well. Um, so I, I, it, it isn't just a matter of, uh, of, of mandating that, that landlords uh, do this. We would want to see uh, some subsidies come into play to, to, to help them achieve those, uh, those higher standards. Uh, and yes, I think it would have to be phased in at an achievable time. Um, I mean, I think um, ECA has already worked out that even if all landlords um, decide to start to insulate their homes now that there isn't the workforce to put it all in place by uh, 2019 when the regulations come into play so uh, you know clearly there is uh, you know a, a massive implementation issue here um, with 
ensuring that you know we have the people that can deliver uh, on this stuff um and i had that experience myself you know um when i took up the the warm-up new zealand grant and uh, and had people come in and and insulate my place and after they'd finished discovered that uh that they hadn't actually insulated my floor they'd insulated a false floor <laughs> below yeah. which was below my floor which i didn't even know about um but uh, you know it, that, that sort of stuff um you know clearly shows the need to to have a a, a well-trained workforce in place that's actually delivering this stuff talking about insulation i think currently the government does offer some grants to landlords to insulate the property yeah. but still thousands of people didn't take it up do you know why is that and how are you gonna fix that well i mean i think there's a, a bunch of reasons why they didn't take it up i mean um <clears throat> you know the, the 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 scheme was quite complicated and uh and i don't think um many people knew that the requirements were coming in 2019 i, I don't think that that has been uh well signaled uh, I think if that was the case, then more people would, have, more landlords would have taken up uh, the, the the insulation grants uh, while they were available. So, I mean, I think um, there's quite a bit more work to do in terms of uh, you know educating uh, landlords about any sort of uh, warrant of fitness standards that are coming into play, and educating them about the grants that that are available to help them uh, do that. But we need to make these grant schemes simple, easy to access. Um, so that so that people don't have to fill out a ton of forms and get community services cards and whatever. Have you spoken to property investors? Uh, because there is a a rumor saying that it's actually cheaper to pay full price rather than go and use um, these grants because people just inflate the price. Yeah, I have heard that. Uh, it's not that that's not the case uh, across the board. I I, I know. I know of um, I, I definitely know of some operators that are that are doing that that uh, that particular uh, racket, um, but uh, there are also some that are you know that are delivering a pretty cost-effective service. So I guess it's a matter of encouraging people to to, to shop around and uh, and um, helping people to uh, you know make sure that they get uh, you know a, a, a qualified person who, who's going to do a good job at the at, at the right price so i think i think there's definitely more that the um that eco could be doing in, in this area fair enough what's your opinion about airbnb how are you gonna <clears throat> make it fair for everyone because there are i think about seven thousand listings in new zealand so there are a lot of landlords that use airbnb and they will be exempt from warrant of fitness and possibly other regulations that's a bit unfair, isn't it? Uh, because they're using, because they are uh, operating a short-term uh, tenancy. Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I mean, um, I think uh, you know, short-term tenancies are are uh, you know uh, here to stay. I mean, this is the thing with um, things like Airbnb and, and, and Uber. We we can't um, you know we 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 can't get around uh, these sorts of um, uh, market changes uh, we, you know we have to we have to roll and adapt with with them as they come um, so I, I don't I don't have any particular you know problem with that um, but I do think that if people are um, you know able to uh, well I, I, I guess the the wider point here um, is that any sort of increased rental regulation in the absence of uh, more broader taxation changes is going to restrict uh, supply, right? So your example would be people will turn to Airbnb. Others might be that they simply, um, you know, change their their housing to being owner occupied. Um, so there would be an impact on supply, um, and I totally agree with that. This is why any sort of rental property changes need to be done at the same time as uh, altering our tax system because. The key thing about the tax system proposal that I put forward earlier is that it also hits those who are land banking, who are sitting on uh, land that they are not developing, uh, and it will encourage them 
that sort of tax would encourage them to get on and actually develop that land uh, rather than simply waiting for more capital gain in the future. Um, so I think, you know, those two, um, that, that, that will increase the supply of, of housing and, and will uh, drive people to um, use housing much more as, an, as a proper investment tool, a productive investment tool, rather than a speculative investment tool. I have to disagree with you on one thing that you're saying that the government, it's hard for the government to catch up with the technology and you, we have to use the current tools. But at the same time, you mentioned about your tax reform where you, where you and that's a good idea, where you you have to apply a, a broad tax and with, with, with little exemptions so to make it fair. But w w with a rental policy, when you don't require homeowners to have warrant of fitness, you you actually make an exemptions for certain number of people. It will be thousands of, the, of them. So it's like with vehicles, if you think about the car, every mm. car has to comply with warrant of fitness. So it's, it's not the like taxi drivers or Uber drivers. So why do you have exemptions on some homeowners? Well, if there is a way to to, to regulate, um, you know, that area, then that would be worth looking at. But I, I'm just being realistic that, uh, um, you know, it, it, I think I think the thing with Airbnb uh, is that it's a it's not it's not uh, designed for long term tenancies. So you know, the issues with um, with uh, you know health problems developing from a person living in a house for a long period of time is not quite as great a risk. Um, but the other issue I'd say with Airbnb is that uh, you know the whole design of that market is uh, is, is is very much a uh, you know a, a, a graduated one, so that people can you know rent rent a room right through to uh, you know renting an an entire house. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious that people, uh, and, and, and people, you know, uh, are able to, to, you know, get a sense of the place before, before they rent it. Um, I, I just think that with, um, you know, with something like that, you, any, any rental warrant of fitness is, is, uh, you know, presumably not likely to apply to someone who who rents out their spare room to someone. You know, a, a, a flatting situation either. Um, so there are always going to be uh, exemptions. Um, but if you do want to um, rent out an entire house uh, for 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 the long term, I, I I do think there should be some sort of minimum quality regulations around that. And it's not just. Top party. I think it, it applies to all political parties because it may seem low numbers at the moment where we have Airbnb users and landlords, but it's like Uber. It will catch catch on very quickly and we'll have ten thousands, twenty thousands, maybe in the next twenty years. And I think there was a recent article about the hotel industry where they they think well they have some evidence that not many people use. They've got uh, fire alarms in all properties and it doesn't meet other health and safety requirements and the, the reason is that short-term tenancies as far as you know is anything under three months or two months and you need only one accident where a person gets harmed and like who's going to be liable for it so i think it's important for all political parties to take on board and consider short-term yeah. short-term tenancies to be as um you know important mm. well you know i think it, it is it's it's definitely worth looking at but i mean the uh you, you do you do kind of have to balance the uh uh you know the amount of uh red tape compared to the uh you know compared to the uh length of the length of the stay i mean um and and i, I guess if you have a system which is you know wh which you know uh which Basically, puts the owner onus on the on, on the landlord to provide certain um, you know provide certain things. 
um, and we're not requiring a mandatory check on every single uh, house, then you know perhaps that's doable. Regarding your other policies, um, obviously tax reform is is your biggest, as far as I can see, is big, your biggest policy and your biggest unique selling point. Yep. Do you have anything that will fix the supply? How are you going to address the supply? Yeah, the actual, well, uh, the, the building, the construction industry. Yeah, I mean, so like I said, I mean, the, the, the key thing about providing affordable housing is actually having affordable land. Uh, so while there are problems with New Zealand's uh, building supplies, you know, there, there is a bit of a duopoly going on there, which, which a reform of competition law could certainly, uh, you know, help sort out. Uh, the much bigger issue there is, is actually the, the, the cost of land uh, as, as a driver of the cost of new housing. So, um, you know, our focus there is to, is, is to really kill off the, the capital gain in, in land by, through, you know, through our tax reform. Uh, and that will uh, encourage, you know, people who have formerly been land banking to, to actually crack on and, and, and build uh, houses. So it will encourage the the efficient use of of land rather than land banking, uh, and we think that'll make quite a big difference to supply. Are you in favour of ditching RMA and making it simpler to build houses? Um, not really ditching the RMA. I mean, um, it certainly could be made a, a whole lot simpler. So, I mean, there has been talk, uh, you know, about. Um, you know, providing greater central resources uh, and templates to, uh, you know, uh, allow um, council uh, allow councils to, um, uh, to to streamline a lot of their processes and make sure that there's greater consistency across New Zealand in terms of those those processes as well. Um, so th we think those those would be uh, you know good changes to make. Um, definitely having um, uh, urban development agencies is a, is a step forward. I think Labor and National are both uh, committed to that point now. Um, but the, uh, the 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 key thing around the environment with the RMA is that actually at the moment the uh, neither the environment or the developer is winning from the current setup uh, because the you know the current setup just just encourages this kind of adversarial approach, which is which is very expensive and and doesn't improve the quality of decision making at all. Um, so we ha we are proposing some changes uh, to to the decision making process, which would uh, you know simplify that, uh, allow um, councils to come to a, a decision more quickly, uh, and um, also make it easier for um, you know non government organisations to. Um, to be involved in the process without that risk of of, of nimbyism. Uh, so we think that there are some environmental and development win wins by getting by removing a lot of the bureaucracy from the process, coming to solutions a lot more quickly, uh, and um, and having simple ways of knowing what the impact on the environment is, uh, simple guides and, and ways of compensating for that for if a developer wants to continue. Sure. What what's your say if in in the first term if you do become part of the future government? What do you think is going to be your bottom line? What what what's going to be your one policy that you want to implement? Well, uh, I mean, you know, the the only bottom line that we have uh, that we have put forward is that we won't work with a with a government that wants to um, get rid of the uh, Maori seats. Uh, so that makes it quite difficult to work with um, New Zealand first. Um, but other than that, we're prepared to work with, with everyone. Um, and, I mean, I think, you know, it would be more likely that different ones of our, you know, different parts of our policy package would, would progress with uh, Labour uh, compared to ones that would progress with, with National. Um, so it's difficult to select one, but I do think, as you pointed out, 
you know, that tax reform that we're suggesting is the most, uh, you know, is, is, is the most unique part of our policy package. Uh, it is what stands out and um, that, that is what we would like to see uh, at, at least, you know, um, being discussed a lot more closely uh, in, uh, in New Zealand, not just for the sake of reducing inequality, but also um, for the sake of improving our economy, because at the moment, all of our investment is going into speculation on housing and land, and, and, and we should be investing in businesses, uh, in, including, um, including building houses. We should be investing in businesses that actually provide jobs and exports. Good point. All right, uh, thanks for your time, Jeff. Uh, I, I think your party has done quite a big achievement, been just here for the first year, and you polling, I think, 10 times higher than other parties like ACT and United Future. So you've done, I think, exceptionally well. And I wish you all the best, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again. Thanks, Max. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, Jeff. See you.